Good afternoon, Mr. President, VPAA, our guest speaker, faculty, staff, and students. It is my pleasure to serve as moderator for the fifth AAT Distinguished Adjunct Faculty Seminar, which will be delivered by our Distinguished Adjunct Professor, Sudeep Kumar Rakshit, entitled Transition to a Sustainable Bioeconomy Global Perspectives. On behalf of AAT, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We appreciate your taking time of your busy schedule to join us in what I am sure is going to be a very enlightening talk. We are also having a live broadcast of today's event for those who are not able to join us. Following the event, we shall also be uploading the talk onto our DAF website and we'll be sharing the link in due course. To begin this DAF seminar, we are pleased to have our AT president, Professor Warasak Ganok Nukunchai, deliver the opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, we are very happy that uh, Professor Sudip Rakshit is able to visit us, uh, also with, with his family, Mrs. Uh, Rakshit and the two children who is now big boys and big girls. I understand that one of them was born here in this campus. So I was told that they are coming home. In fact, uh, for many people who have served AAT, you know, once being a family member of AAT, they are member of AAT forever. So the, this is the home to many people. And of course, the, the, we are uh, very happy that from time to time they come and visit us. And uh, this is an occasion that uh, we organize what we call the Distinguished uh, Adjunct Faculty uh, series of the research seminar. And uh, Professor Rakshit kindly uh, accept our invitation to come as a fifth, the number five DAF series that we organize. Uh, of course, the, this is during the term break and uh, some of our faculties, friends and even the former student of Professor Rakshit may be watching this uh, live at home because this is the has, this is uh, broadcasted uh, real time you know so our friends will be able to watch uh, con comfortably at home uh, before I pass over to our VPA to introduce uh, Professor Rakshit, I would like to uh, give you some background about, you know, uh, what is meant by distinguished uh, adjunct faculty or adjunct professor. I think the, over the last 56 years or 57 years, AT has the been lucky to be associated with so many top professors around the world to what they call segment system. Many countries, you know, originally the support AAT by sending faculty to teach here. And later on, we are lucky to be able to the continue our, our uh, pool of prominent professors by recruiting direct high faculty ourselves. And uh, as we know, the, the kind of turnover of our faculty in AAT is quite high because most of them, you know, come here for a short period and they return. So we have uh, a pool of more than two, three hundred uh, former faculty of AAT who still love AAT, 
who still would like to contribute, you know, to AAT, regardless of the any return. Yeah. So, so uh, from time to time, I have received the uh, email from some of my former colleagues. You know, let me know what I can help AAT. Okay. Don't worry about other things. You know, if I pass by, just let me do something for AAT. So that gave me some idea that perhaps we can do it more systematically. So I, I start this, uh, you know, DAF, Distinguished Adjunct Faculty. And we just sent out invitation to all our former faculty. And up to now, we have about a pool of 70 very prominent uh, professors worldwide who are ready to give us a hand. And therefore, uh, we, we also thought about you know, how we can sort of engage them in our day-to-day uh, -day activities. So they serve as our advisors. Every few will be able to uh, kind of communicate with them for advice. But uh, many times they pass by this part of the world. So we, if we know, we would invite them to come and give a lecture, something similar to today, which is the series of the research seminar done by our uh, former faculty. And even the, if they want to take sabbatical, sabbatical leave, we can host them. You know, they can be here for one or two semesters, you know, interacting with our students, and we could uh, provide all the uh, accommodation and local expenses. So this is something that we, we also would like to do. So with this, I would uh, perhaps pass over to VPAA for this uh, very exciting uh, lecture by Professor Rakshit. He has been away for two, three years, and become a big guy in Canada, such tier one chair of Canada researchers. You know, so, so I heard that there exists only less than 20, 30 people holding that position. And I think he, would be, he will serve as our ambassador in Canada. So with this, I officially and formally thank Professor Sutip Lakshit for Kylie Serve Institute once more. Thank you very much. Thank you, our AT President, for your kind remarks. Next, I would like to invite here to the stage our Vice President for Academic. Professor Siwanapan Kumar to introduce our guest speaker today. Good afternoon and welcome to this DAF series seminar. And it's my pleasure to introduce our former colleague, friend, Professor Sudeep Kumar Rakshit. He is currently the chair professor, Tire One, which is the highest uh, tireship available in Canada uh, at Lakehead University in the biorefining and bioenergy processes. He is also associated with the chemical engineering department uh, at the Lakehead University. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, he has been at AIT since 1995 as a faculty in food engineering and bioprocess technology and then from, became a professor in 2005 and then later as vice president research at AIT in 2005 until 2012 uh, when he left for Canada uh, Lakehead University. Uh, as you can see, he had a very distinguished career. Before coming to AIT, he has been a faculty at the Chemical Engineering Department at the Indian Institute of Technology in Chennai, Madras. 
Uh, in terms of uh, his educational qualifications, uh, he has his PhD from IIT Delhi and BTEC from Jadavpur University and also uh, chemistry honors from Loyola College, Chennai, all three very prestigious institutions in India. With this brief remarks, it's my pleasure again to welcome Professor Rakshit back to AIT for this DAF series lecture, which is titled Transition to a Sustainable Bioeconomy Global Perspectives. Please give a big hand to welcome Professor Rakshit. Let's go through this. Uh, I'll be talking to you about the bioeconomy and uh, an international perspective. Perspective means some, the work I knew about in India and Thailand and now in Canada and the US a little bit. So that would be my talk for today. And uh, the contents of the talk uh, will be, I, I'd like to make it a little bit interesting so you know the background of how it all had happened. I'll start from historically how the uh, need for a fuel from changing from fire to be the real source of energy, starting from there. But I'll very quickly come to what we call as the bioeconomy. I'll give you a definition of what people say is the bioeconomy. I'll, uh, just to prove that I do some work as well, I'll go very quickly through some of my own technical work. I won't bore you because, but if you're interested at any time, especially students, I would certainly love to talk to them. And, and, and this talk is more designed for students to get some interest in some subjects like this. Yeah? So if any student wants to ask me any questions before, during, after, I'd be very happy to, do, to answer and talk to them. Yeah? So, so the second part, of course, would be the major bottlenecks to change from a fossil fuel uh, type of a situation we have to what people like to have in the future, a greener, cleaner energy sy uh, system. And uh, what are the chief uh, uh, problems with that? Yeah, the, and what I like to highlight is usually when, uh, when economy, when you talk about any economy, you talk about available resources. First of all, you have to have what you want to sell. And then if it is uh, to be converted to something else, you should have the technology. But I will show you in this presentation, but in, in this area of bioeconomy, that is just part of a very large picture. Having the resources and the technology is certainly not enough. The politics has to be right, sometimes the faith has to be right, and many other things has to be right for that to work. Yeah? So that's what we'll be talking about. So some basic assumptions, of course, the first assumption is that you have to remember that I'm a chemical engineer and a bioprocess engineer, so my perspective is from that direction. But uh, initially I'll be talking about uh, I mean, the, when I mean the world is flat, it means it's not like, say, 10 years or 15 years ago, something happens in the U.S. and that is, you don't have an effect anywhere. But now anything happens anywhere, it quickly uh, permeates to the rest of the world and there are changes which happen. Yeah? That, that, that's, that's what I mean by that situation. And I'll give you some examples as we go along. And then uncertain geopolitics especially in the area of energy, how the politics and the situation change. And what is happening in present day is that the technological changes take effect very, very quickly. Very, very quickly and we are just at the starting point of that. And for people like me who are, we have to be absorbing technology including our cell phones and such thing usage very, very quickly. Things are changing in a dramatic speed so we have to be aware of that as well. Just to keep you in track of this, what is the bioeconomy? The bioeconomy economy encompasses a utilization of renewable resources. Yeah? If you look at it that you don't want to use fossil resources, you want to use renewable resources and hence uh, with the aim of getting reduced greenhouse gases, decreased uh, dependence on fossil fuels, improved food security and uh, empowerment and having some labor inputs to it. This, this definition, there are many definitions which one can get. I like this definition because it covers most stuff. Yeah. Now let's go back a little bit about the first time the oil was discovered as a source of energy. Yeah. It was, used to be fire which used to be used as a source of energy. About 160, 170 years ago, 
1830s, 1860s or so, oil was first discovered in USA, yeah, in the United States. Yeah? Many would think it is in some other part of the world, but it actually happened in the, U in the States. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, when I was in AIT, I always used to say, we have to go to a green economy because these fossil fuels are finite. And among other people who, there was one professor who used to always object and tell me, Fossil, fossils are not for, uh, finite. And that used to be the person sitting in the first row, Professor Kumar, used to always say, Sudeep, I've been hearing this for the last 50 years and always they find something new. Yeah? So whenever I talk about this, I talk about Professor Kumar and he's right in that sense. It is, fossil fuels ha have been found and will be found in the future, but they are not exactly the same. And that's what I highlight there. The shale oil and the oil sands which we have discovered in North America and US and Canada are certainly different from the oils which are available in Saudi Arabia and such places. Uh, if not anything else, the, the, it is much more difficult to extract the oil and use it. And I'll show you that in numbers as we go along. Yeah? So, and that, that's the background there. This is the first uh, oil fields which were just generated in Penn, in Penn State in the US. And uh, just to make the story interesting is at that time when it was first found, they found a black color liquid and they found that it was inflammable. Uh, President Eisenhower said he wanted to use that inflammable oil for making street lights. That was the first application of what we call crude oil today. Yeah? People did not know it is going to change the way we live forever. Because it's... And, you have to be very careful about this, is that crude oil is not used only for transportation. It is used for all the plastics and other things which we use in our day-to-day -day life. It's completely, is everywhere in our lives there. So that's there. Very quickly, this is the gentleman who helped in finding more oil there. It was uh, Colonel Edward Drake, as he was called. He helped to explore the first people who find, found those there. And they had a lot of stuff. This is how it looks today, that place. That place is now kept as a, a, a memory site for mechanical engineers. Yeah, so it was mechanical engineers who were used to do the drilling and taking out the oil and get it, and now it's a green, lush, beautiful place. Uh, the picture is not very nice there. It is supposed to be nice and green lawn and a place for uh, reminding ourselves that this was the first place where petrol crude was determined. Some years later, 50, 60 years later, in what is today Saudi Arabia, a citizen of, the, of New Zealand found out uh, the oil wells, and he did such a good job that he was called uh, Abu Naif, Abu Naif meaning father of oil by the Saudis. He helped them find what the amounts of oil they have. And if to give you a rough estimate, they have about 40% of the most of the oil resources in the world. Yeah? So that's huge. But I'm just giving you this historical perspective, saying this is about 50, 60 years later. Yeah? What happened in that initial stages was they found the oil in Saudi Arabia, and they, but they did not have the technology for refining them. And hence, some of the international companies, like to say Shell and such type of companies, used to go and take that crude and refine it and make it into petrol, etc. They used to have about seven companies, and those seven companies were called the Seven Sisters. The Seven Sisters used to control the price of the petrol, which was owned by Saudi Arabia, but price determination was done by Western oil companies. So. It was not uh, long before people woke up, and uh, when I, whenever I talk about this, I talk about our own country in India where cotton was grown and it was taken to the uh, United Kingdom and changed into clothes and brought back and sold in India. Exactly the same situation. They used to take the crude from Saudi Arabia and they used to set the prices, but that cannot go on for too long. And then this, they formed what is known as the OPEC countries, the oil and petroleum uh, economic zone countries there, all these uh, countries which then took over their own belonging actually. They learned how to crude and they said, we will set the price, not you. This is our resources, you don't have to be setting the price for us. We know how to do it. And of course, we know now that they are, have a lot of money and they can do what they want. But 
as in history, the cycle turns completely from a situation where the seven sisters used to control. Now the OPEC countries said, you don't have to do it for us because you don't do it right. And now, if, if you are with me, you would understand that they also don't do it right, maybe. Yeah. What happened was after that, even after they took over, if you look at any one of these lines, this blue line or the orange line, blue line is mean actual price, orange line means the dollar compared to the 2008 dollar. You don't have to understand too much of economics for that. You can see that the first levels are almost straight line. That means the oil prices did not change at all. It remained exactly the same. They did not change and then it started changing sometime later. The first crisis came in 1973. What happened was that uh, the OPEC countries decided to spite the Western countries, spite the United States for, for, the, uh, for their supporting Israel in what is known as the Yom Kippur War. So they wanted to do something to hurt the United States. They said, let's change the cost of petrol because everything is dependent on petrol. And the cost of uh, the crude changed from $3 a barrel to $12 a barrel in that one year. That is four times the price. Yeah? Just to give you an idea, about two years ago it was $100 a barrel. Yeah? But that doesn't matter. $3 was as strong as $100 was. So $3 suddenly became $12. And what that resulted in was all countries in the world, especially the Western countries, decided that we have to do something so that we don't become dependent upon this crude oil. And I start with all this by saying, that's when bioprocess engineers like me were first born. Yeah? We were said that let's start looking for sources which will help. Uh, find new ways of using fuel other than crude. So the birth of biofuel research. Yeah? And I just take an example of a very typical very advanced uh, institute, which I was, I'm a proud alumni of, uh, IIT Delhi. We started almost exactly in 1973. One of the professors who started there came from the United States and started a program in IIT Delhi, same time. And he started doing, trying to produce alcohol from what is known as lignocellulosic material, technically, but you can just take it to be woody material, yeah? wood and rice straw, wheat straw, etc. And his, he's dedicated his life to it from 1970 to about the time I, I'd finished my PhD program. We had about 40 PhD students doing only producing alcohol from lignocellulosic residues. And in 1990, we had a pilot plant. When I graduated, we had a pilot plant to produce 100 liters of absolute alcohol from agricultural residues. And I say this with many reasons. One is that technology is there. From 1990, we have technology for converting rice straw, wheat straw, and bagasse to alcohol, which can be blended with petroleum to use as a, as a, uh, in, in, in the gas stations which we use. We have it, but it costs more to produce it from those agricultural residues, and hence it is not used in any part of the world. But it's a very classic research problem. If you can't solve the problem, you have a chance to do more research. Yeah? So we used to say, as students, we used to say, this is a good problem to keep having because you won't get any solution. Yeah? This is the plant we had, the pilot plant we set up in our, labor, in our institute. And just to give you, I'll very, very quickly go through some technical stuff. Don't get bored. I'll come back to some more general stuff. But I have, like I was telling my friends here, I have to show that I do some work, technical work as well. So this is the type of thing which can happen. You take wood, and it is made up of three types of things. Yes, It is made up of cellulose, which is the white color powder. It is made up of lignin, which holds on to that white color powder. And it is made up of another type of sugar called hemicellulose. And these three bind together to form a tree which can potentially live for 50 to 60 years. And in Canada, some of these live, live, trees live for 100 years at, from plus 20 to minus 40, temperature doesn't affect them. For 100 years, they can live without any problem. So I say all this with the, with the reason to tell you that God designed it to be a sturdy substance. And we as chemical engineers are trying to break it down 
pre-treat it, separate it. So the first step is trying to pre-treat it, take out the pre-treatment, separate the cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. Once you get the cellulose, which is a sugar, it's a polymeric sugar, if you can break that sugar down as what is called a hydrolysis to glucose, then once you have glucose, you can do anything with that. I mean, in our, our field, we'll say if you have glucose, you can make any chemical from that. So that's the starting material. You ferment it to alcohol, you ferment it to many other products. And if you can look at this diagram, there have been each step, there are many ways of doing it. And it, if you look at the bottom of the page, it says 1,200 permutations and combinations can be done. Hardwood, softwood, rice straw, wheat straw, this treatment, that treatment, etc. Like I said, brilliant research problem. Yeah? And all of us, in anywhere in the world, people are doing this research, they come up with ideas and still don't get a solution. In our laboratory, and I just intentionally took uh, examples of uh, alumnus of uh, AIT, we did two types of work in, at least two types of work in pretreatment. One was the first one was in a substance which is called polyionic liquids. Yeah? It's a type of a solution, which is the only liquid which can dissolve that cellulose. Cellulose cannot dissolve in water, cannot dissolve in any substance. It is a very hard polymer. But in ionic liquids, it dissolves. And this was just discovered about seven, eight years ago. Somebody, some chemists knew it, but chemical engineers did not know about it. They came up on it and started doing And we did some good work here. We did a number of publications. And the student on the right-hand side, the first one, Dr. Odi Odi, who graduated from here, he's a Nigerian student. He went on and now is a Humboldt scholar. And I say this with a lot of pride because it's not easy to become a Humboldt scholar. Yeah? So when my students do it, I feel very proud. The second uh, student also did some things uh, on pretreatment. He did, some, uh, he used it, uh, a method which was uh, extrusion type of method to squeeze out under heat the cellulose from that. And this student went on to be one of the top students in Kansas State University. He did work in a similar area uh, under a junior of mine from IIT Delhi, but he is doing very well for himself. He's a student from Nepal who came here and did his uh, master's. He topped his batch. He got the best researcher award in AIT. He went there and he has a food processing background. His supervisor made him become a chemical engineering background student, based, uh, just based on hard work and intelligence. Very, very bright student. Yeah? That was one type of work. Another type of work which we did in this, labor, in this uh, institute at that time was, uh, don't look at this picture, you might get completely confused, yeah? so you don't have to look at the picture, is that what we do when we want to make some fermentation product. I'll take a very good example of that. Suppose you want to make alcohol for your wine or beverage. What you do is you take a particular microorganism which can produce it well. You choose a single microorganism which can produce it well and use that. So for different products, whether it's alcohol, whether it's antibiotic, you have a microorganism. We have been trying to get this catalyst to break down cellulose for a long time and could not get a good one. So we started thinking Let's do out-of-the-box type of a research. Yeah? So metagenomics, meta means after in a sense. Yeah? Some people say easy to understand is meta means after, meaning after genomics. What has been realized today is that maybe about six, seven years ago was that what, for each of these microorganisms which we screen, we have a set of microorganisms. We may have about 10,000 known microorganisms. But we realize that in this universe, that's only one or two percent of the total number of microorganisms present, and we do not know to screen them. We don't know how to screen them. So somebody came up with the idea of saying, even if you cannot screen them, can we use them? Can we use the genetic DNA of a microorganism which we do not know exists? So what we can do is we take a mixture of microorganisms, which we don't know who they are, what they are, but we chopped up the DNA into small pieces, and if those DNA have some good characteristic which we are looking for, there are ways in genetic engineering to find them out. That was the background for this research. We all know herbivorous animals like cows, etc., know to digest cellulose. Yeah? We cannot eat paper and digest them, but cows and herbivorous animals can do it, so they certainly have some bugs in their stomach which are able to do it. So in this research, we took samples from the cow's stomach, 
and we uh, broke down the cells completely. We took pieces of DNA and looked for that catalyst if it was there. And we found three catalysts, and there are today ways to find out if the catalyst you found is similar to the one which is already existent or not. Uh, it's actually, they use the technical word is similarity you search for. And we found three or four enzymes which were not similar to anything which was discovered before. And we found that it can do the trick, but not as fast enough. To make the story interesting, the PhD student found a gene which was good, it was different, but it was not solving our problem. So he said, sir, can I submit my thesis? I said, yeah, you have done a lot of good work. It would be brilliant if you could do something useful with that catalyst, even if it is not breaking down cellulose. And then we did some more research and found out, and that's why I tell you this very interesting story. Some of us wear jean pants, you know, this jean pants which are a little faded. The younger generation like it. I also like it now after I know this uh, technology. It's called faded genes. It's blue with a little bit of white strands in it. So what they do actually is they take the faded genes and put it into that same catalyst, which is an enzyme, and that peels off some of the threads and gives you that white color. That enzyme which we found, which was dissimilar, etc., had exactly the characteristic required for making stone-washed genes. He got a brilliant PhD from AIT, yeah? Pakistani student named Tanzeem. I'll go very fast now, yeah, so bear with me. We did some other work on enzyme production. We used an organism like this. We found that if you maintain the pH constant inside the reactor, it works very well. But somebody said that's not the best way. Somebody said if you make the pH go up and down, make the pH go up, it falls down by itself. And then you could let it get, take it up again, it falls down by itself, like those lines on top, naturally falling. It seems that the microorganism liked that situation better and was preferred for producing the catalyst better. I was telling you about the story of IIT Delhi when I went and there were 50 catalysts. I was among the last of those PhDs there. So when I went to the lab and I said, I'll do this, I'll do that, everybody said, that has been done, that has been done, that has been done. So I was panicking, so what would I do? But that panic led to something very interesting that I had to do com something completely different. Yeah? And now I'll go a little bit technical. We, let, let us say a microorganism produces something and you have a rate of production. Yeah? So they say the rate of production of that catalyst is dependent upon the microorganism's growth rate. But we also know that the growth rate is dependent upon the acidity of the reactor, which is a pH. And the pH is dependent upon something else. So we had a situation where you have to, you have to change something, and that is dependent on something which is changing. In mathematical terms, that is called a function of a function. Yeah? I don't want to bore you in an afternoon with those mathematical terms. Yeah? So what we did was the fancy stuff like this. Uh, we designed, a, it, is, it is used to be used in projectile research. Yeah? You throw up a projectile, how it changes. In, as you know, if you throw up a stone, the speed goes, goes on decreasing and then stops to zero, and then it becomes negative. Yeah? So some mathematics of that we used in our calculations, and we found the best, globally best pH system which you can have. Yeah? And we found it is something like this, not that which falls down, not that which is going up and down, it's found like this. And we also found reasons why it is like this. Yeah? So I'm just giving you some examples. Okay, coming back to our oil story, no more of the technology for the moment, let's come back to our story. Yeah? So after that first war, prices went up and then again prices stabilized. Nineteen, a uh, few years ago here, in 19... Uh, 2009 actually, 2007, 8, 9, here, this peak here. In a year, in a year, the price went up from 50 to uh, 140. I was here in uh, Thailand at that time. The price of petroleum changed from 50 to 140 within a year. Remember I told you that the technology is there, but it is not economic enough. But when, it is, when the oil cost is 140, some of these technologies become very useful. So what did the government of Thailand do? 
within that six months, they decided that now it is good time to start a reactor to make wood into alcohol. They started a plant not far from AIT, and they paid a Japanese company turn cube project and did it. And when they, the building was half done, the petrol prices came down. Yeah? Where was that? Within a month, it all came down, and that whole investment was, a, in a way, a loss, as, at least for that project. They perhaps are using it for something else now. Yeah? So what I'm trying to tell you is that in the case of this oil, it is, it is a combination of many factors. And what is the first uh, economic theory is that uh, supply and demand. Yeah? When you have supply, when you have good supply, and you have good demand, if you have good supply and the demand is okay, then the prices are low. If the supply is low, then the prices go up. Say you, if the weather is good, rice is grown, then the rice prices are low. If the weather is bad, less rice is produced, the cost of rice becomes higher. That's what we normally would think as a supply and demand type of situation. In the case of petrol, that's not the case. The cost of petrol is dependent upon whether the Saudi and OPEC countries want to produce more or they want to produce less. If they produce more, the prices go down. If they produce less, the prices go up. So it's not a question of having it or not having it. Yeah? So it's completely different. So that's what we see. It, it happened in many cases during the war, for example. It's Saddam Hussein was shot down, prices went up, etc. But those are temporary things. In the meanwhile, what happened also is that we said that instead of using cellulose, can we use foody material, yeah? starchy material. And we found that if you use starchy material, it's very, very easy to produce alcohol. You take potatoes, you take uh, corn, you can, any of these materials which we can eat ourselves, from that you can make alcohol very, very easily. The cost of that type of alcohol is 75% for the raw material, 25% measure of profit, very easy to do. But like any one of us know, if you're going to use those type of food for producing alcohol, there will be a shortage of food, for sure. This is an example of what happened in Canada. Yeah? They started producing ethanol from corn, and you can see the large jump here, yeah? nearly from zero to 1,600 billion liters per year, in, in, a, in two or three years. Huge increase in production, because they made it, they even made it mandatory to mix alcohol with the petrol. You have to mix alcohol with the petrol, 5% at least for usage in the petrol station. You have to mix at least 2% biodiesel for mixing here. Just to make you understand, in Thailand they have not done it as yet. They were two or three times on the verge of doing it, but they never did it, because then some of the cars have to be changed and that becomes a political issue. They never, but in Canada it is like that. And just to give you an idea, when that big hump happened, the cost of corn also went up in the same way. So what happens is that for a Canadian or for a Westerner, when this type of thing happens, they don't feel the effect. But when, and a real example is when Canadian wheat is sent to Ghana for some poor people, and you make the price four times higher, they're not going to be able to buy it for sure. So these food security problems are there with these starch type of solutions. We worked with a company in our, one of my first projects when I reached Canada was a company called Greenfield Ethanol. They produce a lot of uh, product of ethanol from corn. Yeah, they, they are one of the biggest companies there and we had a project to try to use the remaining part, the stower as it is called, the corn stower, which is used after the corn is taken for producing alcohol, which is the same classic bio, uh, cellulosic material. And just to keep the record straight, this is for diesel, yeah, from vegetable oil, canola oil, etc. And this is a picture to show you, even before November 2014, in the US they were setting up plants and giving many stories of, of, of plants which are going to be producing alcohol from cellulosic. Yeah? And I, when I first saw this and I knew that it's not going to work, I was telling people, this is not going to work, it's been tried many times before. We tried it in 1990, people didn't believe me. But then something else also happened which made sure it doesn't work. Yeah? Sure. These are some of those projects they had all over Canada and US producing ethanol from cellulosic. Not one of them is successful. At least a billion dollars gone down the drain. 
Yeah? People like me going and saying it will work, it will work, get money, but don't deliver. Yeah? I'm putting the blame on myself. Yeah? You have to take a short break here, yeah? Talking about all of them. I don't know if any of you have ever read or heard about this book. Yeah? If you haven't, highly recommend it. You should read. Yeah? This book is called The Black Swan and it is written by Professor Taleb. He used to work in the stock exchange as a statistician to talk about risks. And he came up with a theory later which says that for in this world many dramatic changes happen. Many dramatic changes happen and nobody predicts that till after the dramatic change happened. So that's what is called, and now this term is used as the black swan. That dramatic change which was not predicted and later you come and say, oh, we knew it is going to happen, is known as the black swan. And there are some examples there. Uh, industrial revolution, nobody knew that once steam is generated, trains, etc. will happen. Nobody knew that. Another example is when Hitler became a politician, nobody knew he's going to be such a bad politician. Later we have, even today people make movies about Hitler being bad. Uh, OPEC countries and how they control is an example. Nobody predicted that they would do what they are doing now. 9-11 was never predicted, etc. Yeah? Why am I telling you all this in this situation? I'm telling you all this because in my field also, and this is now my own terminology, is that we always have been thinking that crude oil prices will go up. And hence we have to do green bioeconomy, biofuel, bioethanol, biodiesel, everything we have been saying. But then Taleb was always right, he's going to be saying, there's going to be something dramatic happening. It did not go up, it came crashing down. It came crashing down. The price went from 110 to $30 a barrel. Opposite, completely opposite. And so I termed this one myself in my presentation on this, and I call it the reverse oil crisis, a black swan. Is that a black swan? Why did the prices go down? Think prices go up always. Why do the prices go down? I'll spend a few minutes to explain to this because I find it extremely interesting why it went down. In 2011, just look at the bold letter. Don't have to read anything. But only look at the bold one. 2011, the US used to import 1.7 billion barrels per day. In 2013, that reduced to 1 million barrels per day. January, February 2014 reduced to 0.6 million, meaning from 1.7 to 0.6 in three or four years reduced. So what is happening there is that US, which is a major, major buyer, is not buying petrol. What happened? Why aren't they buying petrol? They are not buying petrol because they found their own petrol in shale oil. And like I said at the beginning, shale oil and these oils are tighter type of oil. They're called tight oils. Taking them out is very difficult as compared to the sweet oils and these oils which are found in Saudi Arabia. Yeah? I'll, give you a, I'll give you the cost very soon. So, and so Saudi Arabia found that their markets, their profits are going down. Next interesting point about that is, and because of that the crash prices came down. It came down to 3040 in November 2014. Okay? We'll come back to that. This is something very, very interesting. Yeah? You don't even have to look at the picture, but if you can, follow it. But I'll tell you the main features of this. For processing one barrel, for producing one, uh, refining one barrel of crude oil in Saudi Arabia, the average cost is 7 to $10 a barrel. So for processing, they take 7 to $10 a barrel. So... Their, their input cost is $7 and they're selling it, they used to sell it for $100 a barrel. $7 or $10, let us say easy $10 per barrel. And they're selling it at $100 a barrel. Fantastic profit. No reason to be crying about it. Why is US not buying from us? Yeah? What does it cost for Americans or Canadians to buy, to make the petrol? Again, for easy, that it's there in the picture. Easy to understand, let us say $70 a barrel. Yeah, for, for making the choice, shale oil or that oil sands as we have in Canada into petrol, $70 per barrel. So if we sell at, suppose the selling price is 100 
and I make it at 70, I make $30 per barrel profit. Saudi Arabia is $5 per barrel, selling at $100, $90 per barrel, no competition. Then why are Saudi Arabia and OPEC countries angry about it? They're angry about it because 1.7 became 0.6. If I sell one item and I get a profit of $100, but if I sell 20 items and I get a profit of $10 each, I'm making $200, which is better. I want to make $200 profit, not $100 profit. So selling it at a high price was good for the Americans. They are making it at 70, selling it at 100. But these fellows are selling, making it at 10 and selling it at 100, but they are selling only a third of what they were selling. They are not making any money. And when, it, when they realized that and when it came to nearly break even, they decided enough is enough. Stop it. And in, the, in that uh, meeting in November 2015, OPEC country decided we decrease the price to 40. So what happens when you decrease the price to 40? Canadian oil companies and U.S. oil companies close their shop very quickly. $70 per barrel making $40 selling price you can't sell. Saudi Arabia making one selling at 40 is still an immense profit. Yeah, you have to excuse me for using Saudi Arabia. Whenever I say Saudi Arabia, take it as OPEC countries, seven or eight such countries together. Yeah? But all of them didn't benefit in the same way. Venezuela, Russia, big trouble because of the fallen prices, because they are all borderline cases. $40, $50 still. Less than US and Canada, but not $5 or $10 like Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, and such countries. Yeah? Nigeria has sweet crude. They call it sweet crude. And I always had a student wondering why they call it sweet. Only recently I found out that it is actually sweet to taste. If you dig into that, put in your mouth, it is sweet to taste. Only one in the, so the Nigerian variety. Sweet one. But I take it as sweet because cost of production is very low. Yeah? They can make it very low. So, by bringing down the prices to 40, American and Canadians, uh, Sean is not very happy. You're not very happy. Canadians lost a lot there. Yeah? No jobs in Alberta, no jobs in Saskatchewan. Many of my chemical engineers were... My, the chemical engineering students in my, in my class there used to say, Sir, summertime, my daily wage, is from, daily wage for normal people is 11. As a chemical engineer, second year, my daily wage is $25. That is before the, uh, uh, this, all this uh, reverse uh, black swan happened. Now those, all those shops are closed, so no more jobs there. Yeah? Okay. I don't know if I touched this one. Somebody is telling me to go faster. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll go a little bit faster. Another interesting story. I won't tell too many more, but one more is that we think that uh, when we make crude oil, we're going to be selling petrol and making money. But one another important aspect of that is if you look at this picture, you look at the yellow part. 70% yes, of all the crude which is processed goes into making petrol. The rest is going into making other things than petrol. Plastics. Eh? Let us take it, classify all other things as plastic material. Yeah? Plastics and other things. So 70% goes into making petrol, but if you look at the money made, 70% makes only 40% of the money. Yellow, yellow, 72% here is only 40% there. While the remaining 30% is giving you 70% of the profit. So what we are trying to say in this picture is that don't try to make a fuel, try to make that plastic and other things there, which is happening. To make a story interesting is that what, we, what happens when the crude oil prices used to go up is OPEC says price is going up. In one hour, Patumthani petrol station will increase their price. In one hour. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. OPEC in Vienna, their headquarters is in Vienna. They'll say we are going to decrease production, price will go up. In one hour, the price numbers will change in the petrol station opposite AIT. But when the prices go down, it sometimes takes two or three months for the price to go down. I wrote a newspaper article in my town, little town in Canada and I called that the feather fall effect. It's called the feather fall effect. When the prices fall, the cost falls very, very slowly. 
And if you know, if you look at November 24, I don't know how it is in Thailand, but in most countries in the world, $100 to $40, but the petrol prices have not gone down that much. In India, I know for sure, it has gone down very, very fractionally. In Canada, it has not gone down as much as it should do. Government is making all the revenue. They're taking out all the subsidies. They're doing many other things and taking out by benefiting from that. Yeah, anyway, here I'm trying to say that what we are trying to say now is that don't make transportation fuel, try to make plastics to replace this instead of making ethanol. Because ethanol, as I tried to prove to you, is not going to be a value-added product because ethanol is very cheap. If you make something into a cheap product, it's not so good. So this is uh, what this picture is trying to show is that this is a very uniquely used by many people is that when the price, when the demand is high, say ethanol demand is high, the cost is low. Yeah, if you look, the very high is ethanol, the cost is low. But those which are not so much in demand, the low value, the high value products are low volume products. So which to choose was an idea. And so what we did in our laboratory and some Canadian laboratories was we tried to say we want to make a cheap product, very cheap product like ethanol, or you want to make a cancer drug type of product which is very high value. We said let us take a mixture of those two, somewhere what we call as the sweet spot. Yeah? So take the sugars, we take, we say, succinic acid to be a place where it is reasonably high and we make reasonable profit, at least we can compete, we can compete with the fossil fuel industry. If you make alcohol, we cannot compete with them. At $40 a barrel, absolutely cannot. So that's what we did for different types of areas there. A uh, very quick one for energy students of uh, AIT where we, energy students here do a lot of work in biomass energy. This is closer to my house and in the province where we stay. Ontario is the first province in the world to say that they are going to phase out using fossil fuels completely for power generation. Yeah? So they have said in five years time no more power stations using coal. Yeah? So near this, these two are both near our house. They have started using wood, wooden pellets for producing uh, the power. The one to the left hand side, they spent about uh, $10 million to make a silo for keeping the wood pellets inside so that rain and precipitation, snow in that part of the world do not affect the pellets. Mm -hmm. And the right hand side one is in our city. They are using something called advanced pellets. And those who are in the field, please do not think that it is torrification. It is not torrification. That's my first lesson in Thunder Bay. When I went there and asked, what is advanced pellet? They said, it is not torrified pellets. Yeah? It is some other technology which they are using so that you can keep the wooden piece in the snow, in the uh, rain, and when you put it inside the power station, it will give the same amount of heat. Yeah? But very strange thing happened in this world. When I reached uh, Thunder Bay and I heard about this, I also heard in the same breath that the technology for advanced pellets was coming from either Norway or Texas. So the wood pellets which were being going to be used in Canada, the richest country in the world as forest is concerned. All around boreal forest is the biggest forest in the world is in Canada. Technology for making advanced pellet has to come from Norway or from Texas. So I said it is not rocket science, give us some money, we can do it. And the more I ask that question, I find myself becoming volume going down because it is a completely political issue. It is not a technical issue at all. They don't want to have these two power plants. They already have oversupply of power in that region. They don't need these power plants at all, is what I know three years later. The power supply, these two power plants are there just to top up when the grid is having some difficulty. But they can't come out and stop it because politicians don't want to do that because they'll lose the vote. So that's what I'm trying to say. See, it's not power and <laughs> supply and demand as I showed in Saudi Arabia. Here they don't want to close because people will get, lose their salary, but they're willing to spend $10 million to put up the silo. They're willing to buy the technology from Norway or Sweden or whatever else, but not pay a researcher to do it ourselves. Very quickly, then what we have to be looking for in this type of fuel is to see if it saves money, if we are good enough, uh, is it comparable to fossil fuels, it is green enough, and all those technical things have to be taken into account uh, for a technology point of view. But the politics point of view is very important, and what your big brother US says is very important, everything else is very, very important in finalizing your situation. 
So wh where does it leave us if you're not going to be doing that? Like I said, don't produce bio-alcohol, by make some other products. What we believe in now, and this is maybe towards the end of my talk, is that here what we are trying to say is that don't try to, many of the power paper mills in, in, uh, in Northern Ontario and the place we live are closed. In the city where I now reside, there used to be five paper mills. Today there is only one paper mill. And the prediction is that all paper mills, I don't know about this part of the world, they'll become energy producing centers. So they're saying it has to be integrated somewhere. You make not paper only, you make paper, you make chemical, you make power, etc. into the same unit. And that's what is being done. Use the bioproducts, uh, produce uh, bioplastic, wait for OPEC to bring up the prices again. Some people even dream about that. Yeah? That's not going to happen as far as others are concerned. And uh, uh, don't redo the wheel. That's what we are saying. Yeah? So this is what we do in our lab. We are trying to make bioplastics to be short about it. Bioplastics from residues of wood, uh, ethanol, etc. Another Canadian is walking in now. Yeah, can he shakes on that side? So we are trying to say that uh, make value added product. Yeah, that's what we say. We are trying to do a life cycle analysis to truly find out that. And I find, and I, when I tell this to my students, they see, and I'm hoping that some of my students are watching me online because I told them to do it. And normally graduate students listen to their bosses because you pay their bills for them. Yeah, so they must be watching. But yeah, we, uh, we, they say you're very pessimistic about it. Yeah, so I said no, but if you're making plastics, I'm not pessimistic anymore. Let's do it. So we are trying to start a life cycle analysis project on reality. I said okay. Doesn't matter what other people say, let's do the reality. Check to see if it is really useful. Yeah? Life cycle analysis to see whether energy wise, from a environment wise, from a cost situation, if they are good or not. And be truthful about it, no need to please anyone. Yeah? I'll end my talk by saying that uh, for me, the most important thing is that the students, graduate students, I shouldn't stay, stand in this podium and say it, but they don't necessarily have to listen to their professors. Yeah? They should try to think themselves. Yeah? If they have a bright idea, come and spill it out to the professor. That's very important, because otherwise this we will be doing forever. Yeah? I'm just trying to say, students uh, research towards a green economy, they have to come up with innovative ideas which are beyond the box, out of the box idea. And I give you some pictures here. This first picture to the left-hand side is some students from Brazil and Ethiopia and Nepal. Yeah? And behind that is the Lake Superior. Yeah? If, not, if you don't have anything else in my city, we have the Lake Superior. It is the biggest lake in the world. Yeah? And in, in Canada, most provinces have a catchy word to use every time to describe their situation. And they say, superior by nature. And I like it so much. Yeah? Fantastic. Superior by nature. And really by nature, it's superior. Uh, next one to our right-hand side is a place where whenever a graduate student joins my group, the same day or the next day, I take the whole gang and go out for lunch or dinner or sometime. And in, uh, in Thunder Bay and some Canadian places, when it gets cold, you can't go to too many places because it's very, very cold. Yeah? So we've gone to this waterfall about 10, 15 times with all the students I have. So my senior student said, sir, not Kakabeka again, please. Yeah, this is that, water, that waterfall. But uh, for those who have not seen it, it's a wonderful place. I always like it because it's, a, it's not Niagara. So that's why I say it's little Niagara. It's a small little waterfall, not far from our house. Uh, this, uh, you can't really see it. This was another student reaching out. This is a Canadian student who joined us. Very difficult to get Canadian students. Local guy, he joined us. And behind me, you might not be able to see it, but there is what we call a sleeping giant there. It looks like the reclining Buddha as we know it here. Yeah? That's why I put this picture as well. It's a big mountain at the back, and it, our city is very famous for that. It's called the sleeping giant. And uh, the right-hand side picture is some um, Ethiopian student and a Sri Lankan student. And myself pretending to do a lot of work in the lab. Yeah? So, yeah, don't go with the impression I put this white coat every day. Yeah? I, I do sometimes to please people, but not every time. But I spend a lot of my time in the lab as compared to my last years in AIT. 
and I really love it because they don't complain. It's one-way traffic. I say anything and they don't have to reply. They, they don't want to reply. Yeah? I'll end by saying uh, what I have been trying to impress here. Need for a breakthrough technology that can help meet price demands. We have technology, but it has to be cheap. Don't always go only for publications. Yeah, that's very big in AIT in all universities in the world, including mine. Think out of the box. Don't feel scared to talk to your professor about it. There are many good professors who will listen to you. And the last one I've been quoting for many years now is, the Stone Age did not end because of the lack of stones. Yeah, we had Stone Age, then we have Petrol Age, and then we'll have Fusion Age maybe, yeah? And, the, and I like this quote especially because it, is, it was made by the Saudi oil minister. And he was saying, the oil age will not end because oil will finish. Yeah? There will be still oil and we'll find some better technology. And that's what the younger students here, I encourage them to be the catalyst for those. Come and tell us some new ideas. We've tried many, many things. Yeah? And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you would like to talk to me about any of these matters, please don't hesitate. I can go on talking about it, but I'll stop here tonight. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask me. Don't feel shy. <laughs> if you don't ask, I'll start asking you, okay? <laughs> No? Nobody understood anything? Oh, Professor Kumar at least didn't, doesn't want to make me feel bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. First, Professor Kumar. Yeah, yeah thank you, Professor Akshit. Uh, very interesting, and uh, uh, I'm happy that you talked a lot about energy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, uh, where do you see uh, research on bioenergy going? Uh, it has its uh, advantages, disadvantages. Uh, relationship with food, for example. So, of course, there are a lot of projections on the future energy use, but uh, from the perspective from Canada, from the Western world, where do you see the future of bioenergy? See, the, the, in, in Canada, it is very important for them to follow, uh, help the forest industry, because wood is abundant. Yeah? But having said that, the problem is that wood takes a long time to grow there compared to eucalyptus here. Yeah? So that's another question you have. If you develop something there, it will be very quickly copied in other parts of the world because you can grow eucalyptus here and produce the same thing. But so what is being done is two or three fold. It's not, there's no straight answer to your question. Yeah? So one answer, of course, is to work in the areas which you and your group are, I mean, at least your energy department is well known for is in, in the use of biomass for heating purposes, yeah, for torrification and using. That's one way. There's a big industry which is coming around uh, nanocellulose products. Yeah? So they have in, uh, Canada has invested a lot on cellulose to make it into nanocellulose, which makes it much more functional, makes it uh, applied in many, many places. But again, I heard some stories that it's not working as well as it was before. So that's why we think, I think it will be working on bioplastic type of situations. And the projection for bioplastics type of situation is that the bioplastic industry will grow by 20% every year for the last next 5 or 10 years. Yeah? So, but when you look at the nitty gritty of that number, it doesn't I mean, add up to too much. Bioplastic industry will increase 20%, but the contribution of bioplastics to the total plastic will remain less than 2%. So what does that mean? It means that the plastic generation is going to go through the ceiling. And you might be producing more plastic from wood, which is a good thing, but it won't be that contribution. So, like I said, you... Torrification is costly. Using biomass is still costly compared to petrol, etc. So... No straight answer, but many attempts still being made. Yes, somebody that side. Yeah. Uh, my name is Janardhan. I'm from AAT Extension. Uh, I would like to ask that given the current scenario of low oil prices, so how it will impact the biofuels and uh, my second question is that uh, 
So the biofuel market is not so developed. So wha what are the financial incentives that government can give in developing countries for, for such innovation? And my third question is that uh, given the, the uh, technology uh, transfer barriers and uh, resource scarcity, so developing biofuels from um, waste residues, so where do you think the, it's going on? Uh, one of the main points I was trying to make here is that uh, if you're trying to make biofuel, bioethanol specifically from wood, it's not going to work. Yeah? But when you make it from starchy material, still competitive. Yeah? Even just barely competitive at the present prices of coal, uh, oil. Yeah? But uh, again, something which I wanted to mention in the talk is resources are different in different parts of the world. That's why I made my presentation perspective. Yeah? Bioethanol for a Brazilian means from sugarcane, which they have a lot. Bioethanol for a Canadian means from corn or from wheat, which they have a lot. Biofuel for Thailand, I don't know how much they are making, but high potential for producing it from cassava. You know, cassava starch, we have a lot of it here in Thailand. But what I'm trying to say is that why should I waste the cassava starch in making ethanol, which is going to give me one dollar a barrel, when instead of taking that one uh, cassava beautiful starch, which we have in Thailand, and make it into modified starch to make it into toothpaste or into a plastic or anything else, which will give you 10 or 15 dollars a kilogram. So that's what I'm trying to say. That's one of the main intentions. As far as subsidies is concerned, there's a lot of talk, and my only understanding of that and from an economics point of view is subsidies are, in the long term, not very good. You can start it, but you have to have an exit plan very, very right at the beginning, or don't give it at all, because it sometimes creates problems. But I'm not an expert in that field. But there are uh, many institutions which say that don't give too much subsidy to bunch it up, because you'll get yourself in a situation where you can't back off, if it answers your question. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Lavaraz Devkota. I'm a recent graduate from Food Engineering and Bioprocess Technology here. And when we post about your lecture here, some of your former students, they were uh, asking us to send their greetings to you. So I send their greetings on behalf of them. Thank you. Thank you. And I have my few questions. Like, we have a lot of rice straw uh, in Thailand, and burning that will cause a lot of uh, environmental issues. So why not we produce ethanol? Uh, why not we produce ethanol rather than burning it to produce, uh, to cause some environmental impacts? Even if it is uh, expensive a little bit, we may have its uh, alternative uses rather than fuel. That's my one question. And another one is, you talk about the bioplastics, succinic acid and the polylactic acid. And are these are done using the chemical method or it is done using the biological method? If biological, uh, maybe I know that the microorganism, the growth rate is very, very slow. Uh, so how do you tackle this one? Yeah. Thank you. I'll uh, talk to you about which of the students told to send their greetings later, yeah? When, when we talk later about it. But yeah, talking about the last question is what I appreciate. I don't know what you're doing, but you're on the right track, I can tell you that, yeah? As far as the chemical and bioprocess concerned, I myself, being a biochemical engineer, working with microorganisms, never looked out of the, that area at all. Always thought, I have to use a microorganism, and I have to use an enzyme, there is nothing else which can do it. But having gone to Canada now, I strongly believe that it can be done chemically as well. But just to give you an idea about how things are in chemical and biochemical, very broad answer for that is that in the case of uh, fermentation and enzymatic processes, you, the raw material can be rather mixed. Yeah? You start from a raw material, you don't have to do much to get it into a pure form, and you can make the microorganism conduct it and produce whatever you want. But when you get the product, it doesn't come single as well. So you're saving in what we call as upstream processing, but you spend a lot on downstream processing. Again, very broadly, chemi in chemical engineering we say, 
70 or 80 percent of any product's value is because of the separation costs involved. And it can go up to 200 percent sometimes in the case of drugs, for example. You'd want antibiotic, absolutely pure. Making the antibiotic per se is one dollar. Purifying it to the level required would make it into $200 or $300, yeah? So that's the background there. So when you do that for a microbial way, you can do it with the raw material, rice straw, wheat straw, whatever else, sterilize it and make it grow. You'll get the product, but you'll have to take out your useful product, say lactic acid, from 50 other products. Actually, lactic acid is very easy to do. If it's a protein or anything else, much more difficult to do. But in the case of a chemical process, the raw material has to be very, very pure relative to that. And so you're going to spend a lot of money on the purity of the raw material, but downstream processing won't be so high. So it's a trade-off there. But what I tend to do and I'm trying to do in my lab is that you try to take the best of both worlds. Sometimes you do one-step biology, one-step chemical. So I have one student who's, who has a chemistry background and he was coming and telling me strange things about bugs or microorganisms, and I, I knew he's not going to do well in that area. So we started doing chemical processing, and he's doing fantastic in it because he's good in it, and we are getting good results. So I don't think you should partition yourself and say, since I'm a FEBT student, I won't use a chemical catalyst. You can do what you want. You should do what you want, whichever works better. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate your coming here this afternoon. And if you want to talk to me anytime today or by email or any other way, I'd be happy to respond. And this is more for students of AIT and faculty who would like to work together in the future or even in, in any, any other capacity. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you.